Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce this, the fifth in the Lunch Club podcast series. And my guest today has, well, I mean, a treasure trove uh, of work behind him, multiple awards. It is a great pleasure to welcome John Batsek to the show. Hi, John. Hello there, Ollie. How are you? I'm in great fettle, thanks. I'm uh, totally inspired because I've been immersing in your world um, over the last uh, little while. And I, do you know what? It strikes me that you have this reputation for being, you know, collegiate, uh, you know, insightful, hardworking, driven, and yet brilliant to work with, a kind and, and good, loyal companion. How do you balance those things? Gosh, have you really? Is that that's the that's what you've gleaned from doing a bit of research on me? Is it? Yeah, basically, I've been I've been Good. looking at a load of interviews you've done, and you come across right. uh, just as somebody you obviously knows her in mind brilliantly, but also you know the people who speak about you just haven't got a bad word to say about you. That's that's quite rare in our industry. It is, although I can point you to a couple who'd have plenty of bad words to say about me. <laughs> yeah, okay. It happens I'll, afterwards. I'll, um, I'll but take it's those. you know, it, in some respects, you know, it's. Uh, you hit upon a, an interesting point because because I, I I you know I sort of take I take great pride in the fact that people say that because you know it, I you know it has been brought to my attention from time to time you know people contact me and say they've been asked they've been told to get in touch with me because they hear that I'm good to work with or whatever and and it's important to me because I think I think we work in an industry that is uh you know that has a you know, has a, a fairly high incidence of of unpleasant experiences for those who get involved in the production process. And, you know, that's driven by, I think, all sorts of things that people bring to the table that they don't need to bring to the table, you know, if they've got themselves to a place in their own lives where they are, I suppose, as much as anything comfortable in their own skin. And uh, I think that's what's enabled me to work the way I work. And I've always very deliberately try to do it that way and and you know uh, I think as a result of that <clears throat> you'll find that you know I can't off the top of my head I've made 14 films with Dan Gordon and five with Amir Barlev and seven with Greg Barker and you know I, I, I establish relationships with people I work with and then we keep working together because we get on brilliantly and because we enjoy the process and equally you know whatever, whatever it is I've made seven with HBO and ten with Showtime and you know whatever it is, six with, with, with Netflix, you know, we, I, I establish relationships and, you know, I think I'm just basically pretty straight up about the way I go about things. And I think in our business, people appreciate that. I think that's true. I mean, it, you know, the world of, of documentary film production and, and your credits are extraordinary. Sh Searching for Sugar Man one day in September and my, one of my favourite movies of all time, actually, Far in Babylon, which we'll come to. I mean, I, I just want to loop back to something you said then about being comfortable in your own skin, because it strikes me that, you know, if you're working in documentaries and you're talking about an idea of truth or you're trying to sift through archive and get to primary sources and actually engage with something that is forever kind of, you know, just over the horizon, you want to get to the emotional core of it. It's kind of, in a way, the same ambition as fiction, but also it comes from it from an entirely different view. So, how important is being comfortable in your own skin, and and how do you achieve that? Is it fitness regime? Do you meditate? What's your what's your secret? <laughs> I mean, I think it's important across the board, whether you're in documentaries, whether you're in features, or whether you're a dentist, quite frankly. And I think I think, you know, I think the truth. The answer to how one, how how I, how one became comfortable in one's skin is by being uncomfortable in my skin for an extremely long time. And you know, I think that's life, isn't it? You 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 learn your lessons through the hard times. And and I think I, I think it's that. And I think it's the fact that you know, I was I feel like I was very lucky because when I when I first had the idea to make one day in September was. Was pretty much one of the lowest points in my life. I, I couldn't have been less comfortable in my skin, and um, I the experience, the process of the experience of having that idea and making that film changed my life. And it changed my life because it taught me it taught me so many things. One, I think, one of the most important things was the value of the truth, the value of being honest. Um, it taught me about, you know. Uh, about integrity and and also the, the just the experience of having an idea meeting the real people telling a, the real people's story in a way that had a profound effect on 
not just on them, but on people in general, a sort of, I suppose, a profound positive effect had a similar effect for me in terms of how I went about my life. It also taught me, you know, I, I think I'd probably, with a massive chip on my shoulder, because, uh, you know, I'd been sort of probably quite obsessively worried about whether I was ever going to make a living. I'm better than that, whether I was ever going to make real money. And I think I kind of knew I wasn't going to, because in my business, you know, it was just not a business where you made lots of money. And I think I I struggled with that. And one of the one of the other great rewards about one day in September was it taught me that the rewards in life, there are rewards in life that far outstrip financial. And they are that experience I just told you where you tell real people's story, especially when it's a story of that nature and you have a, and it has, and it, it strikes a chord in the way that one day in September did. And I think it, I, I used to have this image in my head, I know it probably sounds ridiculous, of literally roots growing out of the bottom of my feet into the ground that was sort of, that I felt like I was grounding myself through that experience. Mm -hmm. And it just was incredibly releasing. Um, so I don't know if that makes any sense, but it that makes, was yeah. the beginning of the process that got me to a place where I, I shared all the insecurity, not all the insecurities, but I shared the ego and the materialism and the, you know, the anxiety about what my best friends or my contemporaries or my whatever were doing, I just suddenly found myself rooted in the joy of telling a real true story with the real people. I think that makes complete sense. And I think it's a, it's a gorgeous image. Um, and it strikes me that one of the things that I'm sensing is that you found an ability to sort of, you know, be out of your depth as it were, or be in free fall with a moment, with a story, and thereby get to the kernel, get to the heart of it. Um, but I'm just kind of curious to, to explore a little bit how you, how you approach like a primary source. I mean, you, you deal with extraordinarily tender subjects. And I mean, in the first instance, literally, how do you, do you have to persuade people to take part? How does it work? Can you just tell us a bit about the process? It depends, actually. It depends. Um, there have been there have been instances where we absolutely had to persuade people to to collaborate with us. And uh, in the case of one day in September, certainly, you know, um, and it, you know, it, it, I suppose it didn't really come as a surprise to me then, and it wouldn't come as a surprise to me now. The families were were always open and willing and I don't want to say desperate but they wanted people to whom they could continue to tell their story because they felt that they hadn't had justice so so you know the Germans took a lot of persuading in that film um, mm. but the Israelis were, were were very willing I suppose I suppose the film that I made that required the 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 most persuasion for want of a better word was a film called the Tillman story mm -hmm. Um, where I told this, where we wanted to, I read a story in the Sun, in the Times one day about an American footballer called Pat Tillman who'd given up his contract as a incredibly highly paid NFL player to join the military, which I thought was remarkable. Then subsequently, I read a follow up to that story, which was that he'd been killed in action and given this highest military award you can for dying. He, you know, the story was that he died storming a hill, killing twelve Taliban, saving his unit. And as I read it, I thought, hmm, that just, something about that doesn't sound right. Anyway, cut to however many months later when I decided I wanted to try and pursue it as a story. Myself and Amir Barlev, who had become a good friend of mine, we've made a film called My Kid Could Paint That together. We decided to try and approach Pat's widow, who was called Marie Tillman. Um, and I had a friend who had worked at ESPN where she was working. And anyway, we got in touch with her and... She was very reticent and very nervous and, to be honest, grieving still. Mm -hmm. It was only, I think, a couple of years since Pat had died. And what we agreed with her was she wanted to meet us. And we, but, but, but more than that, we were going to workshop the idea with her. So Amir and I rented a house in Los Angeles for two weeks and we met with Marie every day. And we just sat and we chatted. We chatted about life and chatted about Pat and chatted about what we thought we would like this film to be. And, you know, slowly but surely over the period of those two weeks, we, we, we collectively came to a place where we had an idea of what the film might be and, and got her to a place where she felt comfortable with us and comfortable at the thought of making that film, at which point she then introduced us to the rest of Pat's family and, and we had to go through the same process. Well, not exactly the same process, but we flew up to meet Danny, Pat's mom and his dad and his brothers and 
slowly but surely we talked to them all and eventually you know months later they 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 agreed to make the film with us and what's what's amazing about that and that that experience is in some respects the most impactful of my whole career um we um what was i going to say we we what was i going to say we do you, do, just to interject briefly do you keep in touch after the well i was going to say i i well with with when with with some i do and some i don't danny tillman pat's mum particularly has become a mainstay in our lives amir and mine mm. his brothers are in touch with me you know fairly regularly and I, I was going to cut to the chase. My, I had a son 20 months ago whose name is Saul Tillman Batsek, oh. which will give you an, a, a sense of the impact that that yeah. family and that experience had on my life. And I wouldn't do that lightly. No. Um, oh, I know what I was going to say. What was so extraordinary about that experience was something that none of us could possibly have expected, which again talks to speaks to that thing I was telling you about, rewards and what I do not being financial. And that is, you know, this family were bereft and bereaved and completely just not completely destroyed but so torn apart by what happened to pat and what subsequently happened to them and the process of making this film in well first of all it it enabled them to heal in a way that they could never have imagined of course it didn't bring pat back so there's only so so much healing that can be done but what it did do most of all was give them back the real pat because what happened in his death was that he was his identity was completely hijacked by the military, by the government, and he was turned into a hero, into a hero that he wasn't. He was a hero in his own very ordinary way, but not in the way the military, they lied, basically. They said he died killing all these Taliban and saving his unit. He was killed by his own troops, and they knew it, it was friendly fire. Mm. They just lied because they wanted to use him in his death as a sort of poster boy for the military, which is something he refused to do when he joined up because they asked him to. Mm -hmm. And our film gave the Tillmans back the real Pat Tillman. And that was just the most incredibly beautiful, powerful, moving experience. It is an incredible, vibrant uh, image. And I, it makes me think of the, the sort of situation we're in now where, alas, it's all too common for the truth to drown in a sea of lies. You know, the fragmentation of the way we communicate you know the sources we are expected to sift through to find any kind of kernel of uh, meaningful information out there uh, i don't think your job has ever been more vital and i just wonder if that has uh, sort of how that occurs to you and how that sense of is it a sense of responsibility or are you just following the next story i mean i gotta be honest i think you know, I think it is more following the next story than shouldering a massive sense of responsibility. I, I, I agree with what you say. I just think that, you know, as you say, we live in a time of such profound untruth mm -hmm. that I don't think it's fair to sit it on the shoulders of documentary makers to write that wrong. All we can do is gravitate towards the stories that we do, tell them with authenticity and integrity and honesty, and hope that they land in a way that makes people demand more of the same uh, i don't think i don't i'm not sure that it does and actually if you look at what people i must be careful what i say but if you look at what people you know the the, the documentaries that 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 make the biggest hit the biggest mark with audiences i'd say some of them risk perpetuating the problem about truth not yeah. not doing what i'm talking about i think that's spot on and it, it strikes me actually it struck me listening to something else you were saying in a, a previous interview um that greed is something that inevitably will distort the the end result you know if you're setting out on a project from the off for personal gain or recognition i wonder to what extent well i think i i probably have a, a hunch about to what extent that impacts the uh, the veracity or the or the kind of in inverted commas worth of the final project. And I think what impresses me about the way you speak about the way you work is just how 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 inclusive and how collegiate you are and how much it matters to you. So, you know, case in point, to be able to retell the story of somebody who was killed in friendly fire and actually get to the truth of that is, is extraordinary. And I, I look at your body of work and I'm, I'm intrigued to know what, what drives you to the extent of, the, I guess I'm getting to the amount of work you do. I was looking at IMDb and it seems you have five in post, one filming, and your credit's just you know beyond infinite scrolling. So what is it that kind of drives you to be so prolific? 
Um, I'll answer that, but let me just jump back momentarily just to, to let everyone in on a secret. If you, In my opinion, of course, I'm not saying I'm right, but I've seen this. People who are driven by what you were talking about, people who are driven by personal gain, people who are driven by wanting to be on a pedestal and to be revered and to be up there. I've seen that. I've seen them get there. And what's extraordinary about that, and it's a lesson for all of us, is it doesn't work. It doesn't matter what you make, doesn't matter what award you get. I've seen this. As soon as you've won that award, that person is thinking, Christ, how am I going to do this again? Mm -hmm. How am I going to be up here again so that everyone thinks, oh, he's there again mm -hmm. or she's there again? So, so, and it's, it's sort of, it comes not, I've never been driven by that, but that's the, that's the magical sort of ingredient of, of, again, of what we do is that if you are driven by that, you will never get to a point where you go, oh, I won that one. Great. I can put my feet up now. I feel great about stuff. It's always just about, God damn it, how am I going to get here again? Yeah. Um, coming back to your question, um, I suppose what drives me is, is a couple of things. It's, it's, it's I love what I do. I absolutely love what I do. I feel unbelievably lucky and privileged to do it. Not least, I, you know, if you've looked at my credits on IMDb, you'll see 40% of them are rooted in some sort of sporting story and I'm yeah. a sports absolute <laughs> fanatic and therefore, yeah. you know, if you win, if we're going to talk about Fire and Babylon, that's a case in point. But, you know, I, to me, it's, you know, in the, I'm going slightly off point, but in the last, I'm trying to, yeah, no, I'm not really. In the last year I've made, the last two years I've made a film about Andy Murray, Sir Alex yeah, Ferguson, Boris Becker, yeah. Eric, Eric Clapton. And at 12 bars, I mean, it's really great. I, it's I'm, like, it's to a, call that work of any sort for yeah. me is like it's a joke. It's like it's such a, it's it's just it's it's such a great thing to do. And also to do it, you know, what 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 I bring to it and what the people that I make these films bring to these projects is, you know, is to make them greater than the sum of the parts. So for all that's about Andy Murray, Boris Becker, Sir Alex Ferguson, and Eric Clapton, the films hopefully become about much, much more than that, so that they can resonate with people who don't know or don't care about any of those people. Yeah. And that's incredibly exciting. So, so there's that that always, and right now, you know, I've been approached in the last month with about all sorts of different sporting projects, and it's just like it's a kid in a candy store for me. It really is. And then, you know, I, I, as I said, if you, I suppose, it's just an amazing. I, I just love telling great stories, stories that can be told in this form, you know. And and I get very passionate about things, and I. I and I help love helping other people make their films. You know, we lo a lot of the time people come to us who don't have our experience and say, "Look, I'm trying to do this. Can you help me us do this?" And much like Searching for Sugar Man, you know, there it's great. I get to cherry pick things that really interest me with filmmakers that I think have got huge potential, and then it falls to me and us, the team at Ventureland, to help these people make their films and that's just you know i can't get enough of that yeah i think the guidance and i i, I do want to come on to ventureland and uh, and discuss that but the um just to pick up on a word you used back then uh you were talking about how the, the movies resonate and i think the the key for me to why i love what you do is the emotional resonance reaches beyond the topic so fire in babylon you know is one of my favorite uh films of all time i happen to love cricket but i have shown that film to so many people and the arc of the West Indian cricket team going from, you know, it just it's the rags to riches. It's the story of them in disarray, you know, facing fast bowling, learning fast bowling, and then going to what would have been called a whitewash to being called a blackwash. The great rising of that extraordinary team and what it did for the islands, what it did for them is and the music and the, the, the amount of stuff it encompasses. I won't bore everyone senseless by just how much I love Fire and Babylon. All I will say is, if you haven't seen it, please just go and watch it. It's incredible. Um, but I've got a question here from a Lunch Club member, Steve Blackman, who'd like to know, is there a subject you'd really love to make a documentary on, but it didn't happen? Oh, yeah. There are, there are a few. Prince. Mm. Michael Jordan. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, Prince for sure. Michael yeah. Jordan for sure. You know, there are... I'm trying to think if people have made films on other subjects that I there been there been instances where I was looking into a subject and then I discover that a, a, a filmmaker like for instance Alex Gibney is going to make it and so I just think okay hats off you know 
he's Alex Gibney. I'll just let him, you know, he, he I, it, clearly there's no need for me to be trying to do the same thing. Um, I think those would probably be my top two. Um, yeah, probably. So another question uh, to follow up from that from John Wolstenholme. John would like to know, apart from the creative team involved, what tends to attract you to a particular idea or topic? Well, I think it is, obviously it needs to strike a chord with me from a story point of view, but I, I always get excited at the prospect of telling something that I think on the surface appears to be just about Sir Alex Ferguson, which in itself is, you know, that's, that, he's a, it's a great story. He's the greatest manager of all time. But what I see in it is the ability, as it's about this thing about of, of how a film resonates, the ability of making something that becomes greater than the sum of its parts and can make people, as you say, with Fire and Babylon, who couldn't give a good goddamn about cricket, mm. watch it and go, oh my God, that film's fabulous. It's so good. And so I get very excited. You know, when I, for instance, if I, you know, I, I saw a film called, I think it's called, Love Means Zero about Nick Bollicieri and Boris Becker is in it for like four minutes, steals the show completely. So I sort of obsessively hunted down Boris Becker and then I met with him and spoke to him a few times. Boris's story is incredible and it's not, and, and it's a bit, it's a bit like um, When We Were Kings, you know, the least remarkable thing about When We Were Kings is the boxing match in When We Were Kings, which yeah. happens to be pretty much the greatest fight of all time. Yeah. The least remarkable thing about Boris Becker's story is that he won Wimbledon at 17, which is absolutely mm. insane. But his story is about identity. It's about belonging. It's about how his home country turned its back on him because he wasn't prepared to be the poster child, the Aryan poster child that they wanted him to be at 17. Mm -hmm. And that sort of followed him his whole life. Boris has never really been appreciated for what he's really achieved. People have always wanted him to be something else. So if you ask people what they, if you ask people, if you say Boris Becker to people, they'll say two things. They'll say no boo and they'll say bankruptcy. And this is a man who yeah. won Wimbledon at 17, won six majors, won Olympic gold, is, is the, you know, has achieved so much in his life. And yet for some reason, no one's ever really acknowledged him for who and what he is. And that has followed him all his life. That to me is a resonant theme that people can people from all walks of life, whether they're interested in tennis or Boris or not, can identify with. That's absolutely spot on. And and I see you're working with Andy Murray. Is it resurfacing? Have I got that right? The, uh, we did that, yeah, that's yeah. right. And a similar kind of, was that, a, I'm, I'm conscious you love sport, but Andy as a yeah. character, were you drawn in by a particular aspect or a moment in his past that led you into go, that's the guy I want to talk to? Well, it's funny, the, the director of that film, Oliver Cappuccini, came to see me. She'd already, she was already three or four months into the process and, and wanted to find someone who could partner with her to, to make, a, make it into a feature doc. As it happens, I've always been a massive Muzza fan. I think he's a, I think he's a, a remarkable player and a actually stand-up guy, I really yeah. do. I think he's... And, and, and so, you know, I suppose what I saw in that was... because. My sense of Andy Murray, particularly in this country, is people are snotty about him. They're yeah. kind of rude about him. They poo-poo him. They don't recognise and appreciate much of what he's done. And again, you know, Wimbledon twice, three majors, yeah. two Olympic golds, yeah. won the Davis Cup, frankly, on his own. Um, you know, and, and the only sportsman ever to win sports personality three times. <laughs> And also, who, who at, the, at the root of his childhood had that unbelievably traumatic experience, yeah. there's clearly an interesting story to be told there. So, so, you know, whereas there are other athletes who are very, very famous who actually have had films about them made, and I would have gone, nah, not for me, because I know you're not going to get anything interesting out of that story. Yeah. Um, let's loop into um, Ventureland, your, your yes. new company. Um, congratulations. Uh, can you tell us Thank a bit you. about uh, how that will affect the way you work, what's going to be different, what we can expect? <clears throat> I mean, uh, I suppose the primary difference is I now have partners in Los Angeles who are, who are actually great friends of mine. I've, I, I ran for the last 11 years all our West Coast productions. I've based out of their, the, the, the holding company's offices over there who are called Pretty Bird. They have a beautiful office in Culver City with edit suites, and we've cut many docks out there. I've now formed a new company with them. So I have, I have this massive support structure in America and these beautiful offices and real high-level executive support. And in the UK, I now have a new team 
um, at Ventureland. And, and but in terms of the work we're going to do, you know, it, it it'll continue to be pretty much the same. I'm, you know, I, I still I gravitate towards feature docs because I absolutely love them. And and you know, we've got a few doc series we're doing as well. But fundamentally, we're just you know we're just going to continue to make the features in the series and and very occasionally possibly even move into the scripted world. Although I'm mm-hmm. I'm I've I've been very vocal about my basic disdain for that world. But but occasionally, a story comes along that works as a doc, but also just screams at you that it needs to be a movie. And actually, funny enough, one of those is, is, has landed on our desk in the last couple of months. So. I suspect we'll make that as a doc and then go on and try and make it as a movie. But most of the time, it'll just be docs. Any branded content and so forth? I mean, Ventureland do do that. In the US, they do it. So, so we're definitely we're open to that as well. Um, you know, and also we're doing podcasts. We're doing a, a mm. podcast on Deep Cut with um, Audible, and we're we're in discussion with them about a second podcast series. So, and I'm very I love podcasts. So. We're keen to do more of that. Yeah, it's a great world. It's a very, again, it's a very collegiate world. But um, I'll, I'll have to have a natter with you after about podcasts. I could, uh, yeah, I could wax lyrical about those all day. Yes, please, <laughs> for sure. Um, so Elaine Tweedle would like to ask the question: uh, the recent virtual can marché claimed the winning genre in terms of deals made were documentaries. So why do you think documentaries are now more popular than ever? And perhaps will they be easier to raise finance for going forward? <sighs> I mean, I think I think they're more popular than ever because I think per film they land emotionally for audiences in a deeper and more profound way than movies do for the most part. I think you know most you know we'll go back to where we started. If you tell when you tell real stories with real people telling the truth, more often if you're making it as a feature doc, it's because it's either tragic or powerful or inspirational, and those things because people love that. You know that's that's why people go to the movies to be moved by that sort of thing. And less and less of that, I think is happening in scripted movies for the most part. Um, then there's this whole business of truth in general. I think, you know, we're all increasingly sick of the lack of truth there is out in the real world. And therefore documentaries is a way of, of, of sort of, you know, saturating oneself in the world, in the world of truth telling. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I don't know about easier to raise money, but I think there are definitely lots of there are more people in the business of wanting to finance feature docs today than there were five years ago. Um, not just the streamers, but just generally there's there's, you know, the numbers on docs are obviously much lower than feature films. And therefore, you know, pe- investors can see there's a better chance of making a return on their money. And, um, you know, I think there are. Like I said, there are a lot more people in the business of wanting to invest in these films. Final question from me, John. Um, in the same way that when I'm watching, you know, a really un- incredible feature doc, I kind of feel like I've vanished and been completely absorbed into the you know, emotional pitch of, of what I'm watching. Are there times in your career where you've, rather than insert yourself as a producer, you've had to just take a step back and, and be hands off? You mean let be hands off on a film that I'm producing? Well, just be hands off in the sense that I'm just wondering, I guess, where. So it's always tricky to insert yourself into a story if you're searching for the truth. And, you know, are there times when you've become so close to something you've had to just sort of let it flourish on its own terms? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 I mean, I, <laughs> I sort of slightly feel these films, again, because of what's at the core of them, they slightly sort of organically tell themselves. Obviously, you need an editor, you need a producer, you need a director, but there are definitely times, like, for instance, on our Marlon Brando film, which Stephen Riley did an absolutely incredible job directing and editing. You know, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's, 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 it's all archive and all audio. We didn't do any interviews at all. And... At a, and it was a huge risk when we set out to do it that way. And it, you know, the first cut we showed our investors was basically a black screen with subtitles and Marlon's audio on it. No way of knowing that was going to work. And yet part of me felt that the way we were going about this was so, it just organically felt like the right thing to do. Mm. But I just felt, let this process happen. And we're going to get to a place where the film is going to be great. Obviously, Stephen did an extraordinary amount of work to get us there. Mm -hmm. But rather than 
get one's hands super dirty going oh no you need to move this there and this here and that you, we had to let it sort of form itself up to a point where we you know we can then help Stephen shaping bits of it but um, ultimately that was a situation where I, I definitely was able to step back and let this thing happen and and there are times like that on films where where you need to just give it time to breathe on its own and let it take the shape that it needs to take. Lovely. John, come for lunch. You're an amazing man. Thank you so much for the interview and uh, look forward Pleasure. to raising a glass together once this uh, current situation is over. Yes, nice. Thanks, Ollie. Cheers. Nice talking to you.